Hello, this is Steve Ramona, your host for Doing Business with a Servant's Heart. I want to thank our sponsors, InPhone, and with InPhone, you can place your business on everybody's cell phone, turn their business into a web app, and with a click of a button, they'll have access to you 24-7. And also Pantheon.fm. Have you ever thought about monetizing and taking your podcast to the next level? Well, Pantheon can do that. Let us show you how. Reach out to Steve Ramona, the host, at info.co slash sr1, and I will go over with you how you can make your podcast really stand out. Let's enjoy the show. Thanks again, everybody. Welcome, everyone, to Doing Business with a Servant's Heart. This is your host, Steve Ramona, and I am so excited to have this guest on. We've talked a few weeks ago. He's got an incredible story, but what I love the best about his story, he's giving back and he's learned so much. And what he's learned, he's giving back. And today, the audience and you listeners are going to learn a lot. Kyle, welcome to the show. Hey, I know I appreciate it. I, I love uh, I, I love the theme. I love the spirit of what's going on because I, you know we've got to inject as much goodness as we can get back into this world. Amen. Quite as selfish. And, and, you know, it keeps me on my toes. I got to, I got to at least make up some good stuff I've been doing, right? <laughs> Just you're serving. That's all it matters. <laughs> well, let's start with the journey. We talked before the show. Let's start with your journey, which is an amazing story. Sure. Now, listen, I, I think it's fair to let you know that it is a, a, there's so many elements to it that we can go down a ton of rabbit holes. What, what I think, and you guide me, but what I think might be really advantageous is I'll just start telling you and you feel free to, to interject or hang on to something and we'll, we'll dive into that a little bit further. But my story is this. I was a young entrepreneur in Missouri uh, back in the mid 90s, got introduced to methamphetamine, ended up in a very short period of time uh, becoming a hopeless junkie, right? And the good news, the bad news of that is that in that game, I didn't have to, I didn't have to ever run out. So I, I taught myself a very complex scientific process of making the meth, which is the worst thing that a, a junkie could ever have. And so I end up in a 24 month period of time, uh, becoming the biggest meth cat cook in Kansas city. Right. So by the time I was 25, 26 years old, I was wanted by state and federal authorities. My exit strategy, if you will, this some of the Silicon Valley terms that I picked up along the way, but my exit strategy was going to be either suicide or an overdose. And I, I took that pretty seriously. God, uh, which it's okay if not everybody's on board with God, that's fine. The universe, life, whatever it is, fate had a completely different plan for me. I end up getting arrested. I face a 30 year sentence. I spend a year of my life in solitary confinement. Uh, just me and this God. And I had to come to grips with what had been done with my life, right? No distractions, no nothing. I have a phenomenal life-changing transformation about what's important, my relationship with God, what I'm here for, all of those things. And I end up getting a nine-year sentence. Now, this is the part that gets confusing I go off to do my nine year sentence and just a couple of months before I'm eligible for parole in the state penitentiary, I get federally indicted and I get shipped off to Leavenworth, Kansas, where I spend the next two years facing a life sentence. So I beat the 30. I end up the, you know, same crime, same evidence, face a life sentence. It did a number on my psyche. I walk out of spoiler alert. I didn't do life. I do a seven year sentence in eight facilities. I walked out at the age of 35, institutionalized, no college degree. I'd never even sent an email. And this was 2005 and in a tier, 10 year period of time, I go from this frightened ex-convict hiding my secrets to a vice president inside a $2 billion publicly traded company. I, I just gotta say, Kyle, I wanna interrupt. Yeah. It's a real life breaking bad. Not the whole story is the same, but that's what comes yeah. to my mind real quick, right? Yeah, maybe maybe Walt uh, had some more noble reasons, right? He was trying yeah. to leave his family with something. Mine was <laughs> purely, but yeah, yeah, there's some parallels for sure. Yeah. Um, right. 
but I, I think the big part of my story, I, it, it's great because that that's, that's true. I think, actually, I think my book is better than Breaking Bad, but <laughs> the, the big part of my story of what I do now, kind of how all this comes together is that fear and insecurity and shame and regret are emotions that all the therapists are going to tell you to run from. They're, they have no value. What are you doing with them? And the truth is, is that I found a very unique way to leverage all of that when and find a way to have that serve me. Uh, it certainly don't want to hang on to it for life, right? I mean, here's another piece to my puzzle. I also had stage four cancer. And I think a lot of that was driven by the, the you know, the fear and the shame and all of those things. But, but bottom line is you need to grow where you're planted. Right. And where I was planted was inside insecurity and doubt and fear. And I let all of that drive 16 hour days and, and you know, teaching myself all the things that I didn't know and and working. Nobody outworked me. Right. Now, th that's not sustainable. It was for 10 years. But um, what I stand for now is a it doesn't matter how far you fall. OK, it doesn't matter what's in front of you. Uh, and I, I certainly understand that there's situations in life where the people go through and it's all relative that may be more difficult than mine, but I, I haven't talked to those people. I certainly had every excuse in the, in the world to not become successful, right? I had every excuse in the world to give up on my dreams and my hopes and compromise the rest of my life. And that wasn't something that I was going to settle for. And so what I understand in spades <clears throat> is that everything that you want in life, everything that you want is just right on the other side of fear, right? And it sucks to get to it. It really does. But what drives me and becomes the breadcrumbs to my, to my forget spiritual path, to, to my life's path, to my success is if something scares the crap out of me, then I instantly, it doesn't mean jump into the fire, but I instantly think, oh, there's something to that, right? There's such a, an incredible resistance that I need to run that to ground. And if I'm not going after it just because I'm a little scared or paralyzed, that's not a good enough reason, right? And yeah. so that's, that's my story. Yeah, and I want to recap just so the listeners heard this. You were at the bottom, jail, life. I was less suicidal. Yeah. And the peak was, tell us the peak. I'm, I'm, I haven't gotten there yet, brother. I love it. But you're in Silicon it. Valley, making a lot of money. Don't need to know the number. Family, you got a family now, you know, at this time. So you went from the bottom to going to the top, way above halfway. So so let me let me just take 30 seconds to describe the bottom, right? The bottom is definitely in that cell, right? And the bottom it, by myself and my mother wouldn't come to visit me. I'd burned every bridge that I'd ever had in my life. No, you know, the, the people that might have come to visit me and lost track of me, I was all alone, right? Um, never thought I was going to get to be significant or contribute or, you know, fall in love or have children or any of that stuff. I'd already had a son, right? But I wasn't going to get to hear them laugh around Christmas trees. That was the lowest. And inside that cell, what became clear to me is that life isn't about the things that we collect. Now, this is trite, and I know a lot of people say it, but life is about community. Life is about being in this together. Life is about love and oneness. And certainly we can go esoteric and talk about our relationship with God, God, but let's just assume for the sake of this conversation, we keep it human and it is about love. It is about all of those higher ideals and the rest of it's just crap and distractions. So if you want to talk about the pinnacle of where I've been so far and I, and I'm not stopping, it is going to bed at 11 o'clock every single night, kissing my babies mm -hmm. to sleep while they're asleep knowing that I have created this world that protects three of my favorite people, my wife and my two girls, and uh, that person and all those fears inside that cell have all gone away, right? So that is the pinnacle of it all. I made a crap ton of money. Who cares, right? I've also lost a crap ton of money. 
Um, I've taken a two, I've been a part of two acquisitions. Uh, the, the, the single acquisition where I became a vice president in a $2 billion publicly traded company would have been the pinnacle of most people's career. But to me, that was just a veneer, right? So certainly I can latch on to those things. Let's not, let, let's not gloss over the fact that uh, being a vice president in an organization that large, being exchanged on the NASDAQ and, you know, having $2 billion worth of assets is something that anybody, even if you haven't gone to prison, would say, holy crap, you know, I became a muckety muck. But quite frankly, mm -hmm. it it pales in comparison to those two girls. You appreciate, and it, you appreciate yeah. life more because you were so at the bottom. And thank you for saying that. I kind of was going the money route and I'm glad you switched. I'm glad it. to do that though. If that if that's the conversation, uh, let's let's take the gloves off here. Uh, you know, I was a, the last year I was there, I made $750,000 and, and I made 650 before February, right? This will give you an idea of, it, it doesn't put a value on me, but it certainly shows you what I meant to that company. Right. And I do believe that in the startup world with the specific technology that we put into the market, that there wasn't too many teams, if any, that could have done what we did. And I led the charge on it. And, and look, most of it is because I think I can do whatever I want. Uh, you know, I think whatever I put my mind to, I can do. Right. And, and I believe that before the drugs or any of that stuff. Right. Yeah. But, but I also, yeah, yeah I was just going to say that first time talking and talk, listen to you again and hearing this over, is if you can do it, I, I, it's cliche too. If yeah. you could do it, anybody could do it. I've not been in prison, but why can't I reach the peak like you did? Right. You have more yeah. excuses than I do. And if I'm wrong, but that's what I'm feeling here. And what the audience to hear is it's all out there for you. Yeah. No matter where you've coming from. Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, it, it, sometimes, you know, you start dropping these cliches and it becomes a little bit Disney esque. Right. With a castle and, you know, some some uh, fireworks in the background. But it is true. Uh, if I had every reason to fail and I didn't, what's your excuse? Right. So and and I, sometimes I think your excuse is that you've had it too easy. Your excuse becomes that you're soft and you haven't had your back against the wall. What would I have been? had I not had my back against the wall, had I not had the awakening that I did, if I didn't live in gratitude to the degree that I, that I do, if I didn't have the fear and the shame, right? What would I have been? Who knows? We'll never find out. No. But what we do know is that I didn't give up and it paid off. I love the soft because that's, I, I'm not soft in a bad way, but I haven't been to prison. I haven't done drugs. You know, I've been any of that. But this is the second time I'm hearing your story. And I want the audience to hear this. It makes me think the first time I talked to you, and I'm going to tell the whole world this, you changed me because I can hear your story in my head like, mm -hmm. oh, I don't want to get up at 5.30 today. I, I can I, No, no, I got to get up at 5.30. I might be a little bit tired, but who can I meet? Well, whose lives can I serve and who can I change? And live that life because you know, Kyle, he told me his story. And again, that's why I keep going back to if you can do it, anybody can do it. Um, we just got to, it's our head, right? Yeah. So, I mean, this is, this just came to my mind right now, but I mean, there, there was a moment where I, I was, so <laughs> when you're in startup out in Silicon Valley, you're, you're out in San Jose, right? Yeah. There's just a, an insane amount of money that's out there. Most people in the world, let alone the States, could, can't imagine the amount of money that's just going back and forth, right? And $50 billion funds, right? And so I I join a an organization that just got $18 million. To me, $18 million meant something in 2007. And everybody on the team, there's 100 people, and I'll tell you what they consisted of, everybody's friend, friends and family, right? We're given these executive roles and, and this $18 million is completely unchecked. And, and it, anyway, long story short, I was in an, an environment, in a culture where everybody was waiting to be told what to do. Nobody was doing anything. Nothing was getting sold. 
And it was okay because we had such deep pockets with our investors. NEA was the biggest venture capital fund in the country or the world at the time. I took it upon myself to not only not buy into that, right? But veer off from a marine based technology into something that I thought had legs. And I did everything. And I am not, I did the marketing, I did the, because nobody wanted anything to do with it. Now, there's a much longer story to this, but plain and simple, I would do the admin stuff, I would do interviews with journalists, I would do um, the press releases, I would do all of those things. And then on my way home, I would put together a hit list so that I could pick up the phone at six o'clock in the morning. I was West Coast, customers were East, six o'clock was nine o'clock. And I would start calling them at six in the morning to close deals. By noon, I'm back to the admin work. And God forbid I sold something because nobody knew how to make it. But the, <laughs> but, but the trick to me was I wanted it so bad that I wasn't going to sit around and watch the leadership team lead because it wasn't happening. Yeah. And what I ended up doing was building a, an executive position for me. I put together a team once they gave me my first executive role that, that took that company from 1.5 million to 14 million in a single year. And it was game on. Yeah. Now I'm like, oh, I might know something, <laughs> right? But, but, but the point is this, it's difficult until you want it bad enough right? The guys like us now, you and I sitting here talking today, we got lots of options, right? It's tough to pick. Me back then, there was maybe one or two directions I could go if I wanted to get to where I wanted to get. So it wasn't difficult. It wasn't disguised. You know, it was, it was certainly uh, cloaked in fear and a lot of work, but it wasn't disguised. That's my one opportunity I'm going to latch onto that. Like it's my dad's leg, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, right. You know, I want to get into the twist in the story. Okay. The next stage. Okay. You're right here. You at Silicon Valley. What happened next with Kyle and what decision? Yeah. So, so the sc two scariest things I've ever done in my life. Number one was walking out of prison. I think most people would think it was walking in or surviving prison. It was walking out. Mm. Number two and I don't even have to bat an eye was telling my story. So I hid everything. Nobody that I ever worked for, that worked for me, none of our friends, nobody knew that I had this background. And so one day I woke up, dawned on me that, you know, every car I drove, the neighborhoods I lived in, all of those things were an extension of my fear. And if I was ever going to take my life back, if I was ever going to forgive myself, if I was ever going to be strong again, then I needed to let the story get out into the open. So I chose to write my book. And in order to do that authentically, I chose to pack up everything I owned and move to Florida so that I wasn't around people that were going to make it difficult. They, they wouldn't have done it on purpose, but it's just that my identity meant something. And I needed to get away from that identity. And I completely abandoned my career uh, and made a decision. It, it felt like a calling, uh, but I made a decision to not just tell my story, but but utilize the benefits of it to better people's lives. And you were making a lot of money. Yeah. But you, and I want to speak for you, but it sounds like you left to tell your story so you could serve more people. A hundred percent. The I'm glad you brought that up. The the one day, all of a sudden, I mean, and it felt like the blink of an eye. Words like service, contribution, you know, and these are idealistic words, right? All of a sudden, were just hitting me right in the middle of my chest. And it 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 when you're running and you're scared and everything's survival, which for me, let's face it, it, it was ten years during prison and just before that, you know, take the drugs in prison, there's 10 years, 10 years hiding my story. So there was 20 years of survival and everything felt like survival. You have a hard time getting over yourself. You know what I mean? And, and it wasn't like I was, you know, so self-centered that I wanted to, 
I don't know how to describe it. I'm, I'm kind of being defensive right now, but, but it, there's no other way to put it. This was about protecting me. Right. And then one day I thought, wait a minute, that that's not what I was shown in the cell. Where's the love and oneness. And not only is my story cool to get off my chest so that I can release the power, but it's not my story anymore. <laughs> that's probably you know, this story belongs to people that can now use it and mold it and shape it and, and start the ripple effect so that, that others, and, and listen, I just did a keynote speech. Uh, I did a, I did a paid keynote speech, but then I volunteered to go into a local rehab center where uh, they brought in a hundred people. Right. And these are people in the throes of, of recovery. And I, it felt so good to stand up there and tell every one of them, don't compromise your life. Don't think it's over. Don't feel like you are getting the scraps off the table because that's up to you. And that stuff feels really, really powerful to me. And being a guy making, you know, at a high end in Silicon Valley, you're giving away your experience for free because you wanted to serve those people in rehab. And I, right. I kudos to you. I, I, it's That's what the world needs is we need to help people take them by the hand and not charge them, not not gouge them yeah because you help one of those guys or all of them that's your reward right there that's your money right there uh, to, to in, in my so i like money and i yeah. am never going to be the guy that says hey go broke if that's your calling go broke if you feel like that's what you want to do and you want to carry a knapsack like the guy on kung fu and walk around all the <laughs> walk around the world <laughs> for me that is not my calling Right. So I, I'm going to monetize things, but that doesn't mean that the people that can't afford it and don't have budget shouldn't get what I have to offer. So I piggybacked off a nice little chunk of change for the people that paid me to come to Alabama. And then I. X. Not this paid X and this cost me Y. Yeah, and yeah. so the the corporate America uh, accounts can bankroll the other stuff. Abundance gives you more ability to serve more others. I learned that. For sure. That's, that's such a powerful thing because people sometimes are afraid of money. You wrote a book, which you mentioned a little bit in the keynote speak. Let's talk about that a little bit. Sure. Uh, the, the book, uh, first of all, I, I do want you to know that I am – very proud of this book. I, I wrote every word in it. I think a lot of people in my position would hire a, a ghostwriter, which I did hire a ghostwriter and he did nothing except take my money. And this is how I discovered that I was supposed to write it, but I'm very proud of it. It is literally, if you ever wanted to know what was a drug addict thinking, this is all written in the first uh, first person narrative. And it, it is my journey from you, you parachute right in the middle of a meth fire all the way to walking out of prison. So it is uh, everything I was thinking as I went through it from the first time I put a needle in my arm to, uh, oh my gosh, it gets really exciting. Yeah. What's the name of the book? The name of the book is Patchwork Junkie. And <laughs> Patchwork Junkie, it... it uh, I chose to self-publish it. So, you know, it doesn't get the New York Times bestseller, but I had a person in the New York Times tell me that this is the book they've been looking for and they never find it. And then because it was self-published, they're they're a little bit snooty about that. But yeah. love the book. Uh, and I highly recommend it to anybody. My my biggest demographic happens to be soccer moms. So it's uh it's it's everybody thinks, oh, drug addicts should read this and no, it's, it's, it's really an edification of how it can happen to anybody. And addiction's addiction. doesn't matter what the form is. That's right. This addiction. So we're running out of time here. Yeah. One, I'd like to bring you back. If you're willing, I think oh. the audience would love to hear more. We got yeah. more to delve into down the road. Uh, how can people reach out to you? Either sure. to be a keynote speaker, which he's a fabulous keynote speaker, uh, or just get a hold of you and ask you questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So... I have a website. It is kyledeanhouston.com. 
Um, and it just jump on there. My, my email address, which is the best way. So everything, uh, Facebook, Instagram, um, uh, LinkedIn, they're all at Kyle Dean Houston. And then my email address is Kyle at Kyle Dean Houston. And okay. the reason I have my name is not because I'm arrogant, but because I was making a statement to the world that I am telling everything and good luck finding anything after that. Right. So I use my full name. Now you have every right to use your name because of what <laughs> you went through. You've been through enough. You could do that. That's a little thing you could do. And I'm going to do something for my audience for you. Okay. The first four people that reach out to Kyle, I'm going to give you a $20 Amazon gift card. You could buy the book, do what you want. I hope you buy the book if it's on Amazon or reach out. But I want to do that because I want to put my money where my mouth is. Uh, I meant that when I said this story has changed my life because I can look back and say, because I can be soft. We all can be. And I thank you. God bless you for thank sharing you. your story in my audience and my podcast. That, that's uh I, I really appreciate that that's that's some heavy stuff yeah you bet last thing uh you've been through a lot we've heard an yeah. incredible story you've learned a lot which experience teaches a lot what can you one more tip you can leave my audience that can help them in their life the greatest thing i ever gave myself was forgiveness right and and listen if if anybody was ever being coached by me I would, I would constantly talk about push, 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 right? But you cannot be soft, but you cannot hold on to your shame and regret. So in business, in life, in spirituality, in parenting, all of it, you, you're doing the best you can, right? Get to a point to where you never do it again, forgive yourself, and move on. Right. 